Uh, so I've asked, uh, I've asked Cedric to join us uh, this morning, and he's going to introduce our, our guest, our facilitator, and uh, like I said, we'll, and we'll, we'll move from there. Cedric, if you can tell us uh, about Brother Josh. I had the privilege uh, during the pandemic to, to meet Dr. Weiss, and um, he is a vice president of pharmacy with a lot of different titles. But the thing I want to say about Josh, Josh has a sincere concern about people. And when I say that, all people, uh, when we were going through the vaccines, especially at the different locations in the inner city community, I saw Josh take a special, special interest in making sure uh, that all people were treated fairly. Uh, he took his time to make sure those people who had questions, uh, he answered those questions, put them at ease, gave them the medical directions that they needed to have. So I am, I'm so glad that when I called him a couple of days without any reservations or hesitations, he said, yes, I'll be glad to come and talk to the ministers. And like Reverend Howard, I, I see him as a colleague, but most of all, I see him as a, as a good friend. So at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Joshua Weish. Well, thank you, Cedric, and I'll, I'll put my camera on, and I do apologize. I am um, coaching football this morning because that's what I do in my spare time, youth football. Um, but as uh, Cedric said, and I saw Reverend Howard earlier, I've met many of you on the call and had the ple pleasure um, to work with you all during the pandemic. And I am very passionate about, as Cedric mentioned, all people, equitable access. Um, but I am very favorable and think highly of uh, communities of faith. And that is a community that I live within. And so it's important to me. I'm also a person that is um, from rural Georgia. And I know many of you um, have rural congregations and communities that you live in. And so that is an area that is passionate to my heart. Um, when I did my residency training, I did it at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, um, which is a urban hospital that serves the Dallas community and one of the largest health systems that serves underprivileged and underinsured individuals in the United States. So I have a real passion for healthcare, especially in our underserved communities and in our faith-based communities. So we, as everyone knows, we had great success. Um, partnering with many of the individuals on this call um, in terms of providing education to each of you and then allowing you all to become confident in the information so that you could share it with your congregations and your community. And I will say, without a doubt, it was one of the most successful um, endeavors that I've ever had the ple pleasure to support. And it's something that gets talked about consistently across the country. And it is only was able to be successful. And we were able to protect people, those that were most vulnerable, um, because of you all's efforts and willing to partner. As we moved on into the pandemic, because of the vaccination efforts that occurred from December through about March, we got a large 90% plus of individuals 65 and older, or those that had very chronic conditions, which we live in the South, and we know there's a lot of those individuals, uh, my family included, that have those challenges. And we did an excellent job of communicating to them and getting them vaccinated. And we saw the impact. We saw COVID-19 infections decrease drastically. And we all were able to return to some semblance of what life looked like prior to us wearing a mask everywhere we went. Unfortunately, um, we did a poor effort. And when we say we, I am pointing at myself and the rest of the healthcare community of we kind of let up on focusing on that next group of people that were really important. Um, and that was moving from those that are most vulnerable 
to those individuals who needed in education to be empowered to ultimately get them vaccinated to not only protect themselves, but to protect those that are most vulnerable because the vaccine is not a cure, but it is a very, very um, effective vaccine at keeping people from getting severely sick or worse off losing their life. So um, as we look at our vaccination rates here, they really have not moved regardless of the community we look at since um, about Mar April 1st. That is true across the country. It's true in Georgia. It's true in South Carolina. It's true in Richmond County. It's true in Columbia County. It's true in Burke County, McDuffie, Jefferson. Um, it is very um, similar at all of these places. And, um, you know, I went back to being able, I'm vaccinated, obviously. Um, I was able to go back to, I call it doing my day job and focusing on my day job, focusing on what we need to do from a healthcare delivery standpoint. But the last three to four weeks um, has become very concerning, both from a healthcare standpoint and the community standpoint, because we are in a new wave of the pandemic. And the difference between this wave and any other wave is two things. One, people are complacent. We've been at this for 16 months um, and people have just become tired of it. And I completely understand that sentiment. And, um, and unfortunately, the wave of COVID that we are in now that you all hear referred to as the Delta wave on TV is worse than what we saw in any of the other waves. And it's worse for two different reasons. One, excuse me, three different reasons. One, it spreads much easier. So with the previous wave, we would have expected for any one individual that came down with COVID-19, that they were gonna spread it to two or two and a half other individuals. And that was somewhat maintainable because time is in your favor when it's that low of transmission. The second wave we had, which was the December, January wave, which was very decimated our country and our local communities, um, was what was called the alpha variant. And the alpha variant was a little bit more. It was about three and a half to four people would ultimately contract the virus from any one individual. And so that's why we saw the numbers spike as high as they did, where there were 300,000 people across the country with positive tests for COVID, which we know that only represents about one third of those that actually were testing positive for COVID. So we were looking at somewhere around 750,000 people a day in the United States at that point in time were testing positive for COVID. Many were without symptoms, many were with symptoms, hundreds of thousands of people lost their life. At AU, we would have upwards of 200 individuals in our hospital with COVID at that point in time. Those were mostly older. They were mostly um, unhealthy because of diabetes, high blood pressure, heart conditions, and other um, comorbidities. The second part about Delta that's very concerning other than it spreads easier is that it is attacking and uh, being transmitted in a much younger age population. Before where we would see one to 2% of people below the age of 50 were in the hospital or having severe symptoms. Today, we may see that number at 50 and 60% of individuals between 20 and 50 years old. And go back to what I talked about earlier, that those that are over 65, 90% of those people in America, 90% of those people in Richmond County, 90% of those people in Burke County have been vaccinated. That younger group is less vaccinated and it is concerning. So we are seeing younger people, we are seeing them, um, we are seeing them be sicker, and we are seeing them require more critical care and not just hospitalizations, which is very concerning. The third part of this, in addition to being easier to spread, being 
focusing on younger people. But the third part is this strain is more deadly. And that's the part that really concerns all of us is that we are transmitting it to younger, healthier people. We are um, transmitting it in something that we call breakthrough infections it's in older people um, who are around younger people who have the Delta variant and they are still able to um, transmit or contract COVID, the Delta COVID, even though they've been vaccinated. And we're seeing some of those individuals come into the hospital. It's a really low rate if you've been vaccinated, but it's still happening. And it's because of the idea that so many other people who aren't vaccinated are around those people that are vaccinated. We're all more complacent, let our guard down a little bit, and we're starting to see some of those individuals get sick. So easier to spread, focusing on young people, and it's more deadly than what we saw before. So what we're seeing right now is two weeks ago, we'd have had this conversation. There would have been a small amount of concern. I was not wearing my mask in Walmart. Um, I was really close to going back to church and not doing it online, my family. Um, and at the hospital, we had got rid of masking mandates outside of certain units. Um, it felt more normal than life has felt for the last 16 months. Fast forward to yesterday and health system leadership and university leadership are calling emergency meetings to discuss a massive rise in inpatient hospitalizations among young, healthy people, younger people who are sick, who are requiring significant more critical care or higher level um, severe sickness needs in the hospital. We model at this point in time that we are going to continue to see a rise of the Delta variant in this community for a minimum of two and a half weeks. And it could continue to rise all the way through the beginning of September. Um, if we, we look at other areas where this particular variant has gone through, and one that we look at is the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom went up for about two weeks and then went down for about two weeks and then they were back to normal. But in the United Kingdom, 80% of individuals have vaccinations. In Richmond County, it's 31%. And Burke County is right in that 30%. Columbia County is about 38 to 40%. Our other rural counties, Jefferson, McDuffie, they go down a little bit more. So we do not anticipate that that, that peak of two weeks and then come back down is realistic for our area because of the low rates of vaccinations. So. What does that mean for us? One, we are trying to renew our vaccination efforts, specifically with our healthcare workers um, and trying to have conversations with any small group of people that are willing to have those conversations. We are wanting to reach back out to partners such as each, each of you to reignite the discussions with your congregations on small group or large group basis. Um, specifically any of those that are unvaccinated to go ahead and begin to get protection. Because what we know is that even against Delta, if you are vaccinated, it's still 90% effective. And again, that's better than anything else we do. Um, unfortunately, we are in a completely different political climate than we were in in January. Um, the reasons people say they're not gonna get vaccinated in January are the exact same reasons they say today. The biggest difference is the way that we have turned as a society and really have taken this vaccinated versus unvaccinated tone to where it is very challenging to even have civil discourse regarding this situation to understand the other person's side of it about why they have chosen to get vaccinated or not get vaccinated. And that demonization is, is very challenging. To get over it is the anecdotal stories I hear of is that talking about the vaccine is right up there with talking about religion, politics, race, and other of the really challenging 
um, topics of conversation that we have in our country. It is that polarizing. I have people, regardless of ethnicity, that lie to their families about that they got it or didn't get it because they don't want to be ostracized. They do not want to be looked down upon. And, and that is a very unfortunate place that we are at today. Um, so, you know, Cedric asked me to come speak or talk to you all and answer any questions you all have. I wanted to give you a lay of the land um, of what it looks like, what we are anticipating it look like. And, um, and then I am happy to answer any questions. The one other thing I wanna bring up that I should have highlighted earlier is that the alpha pandemic that we saw in that December, January, February timeframe earlier this year, at least locally impacted our urban areas more than it did our suburban or rural areas. What we have seen over the last two weeks is that the people that we are seeing that are the most sick that are coming to AU and into uh, uh, affiliated hospitals here around are coming from rural areas. And that is concerning to me because generally we have a sicker group of individuals because of a lack of access to good quality healthcare in their local communities. So they're coming with more comorbidities, other sicknesses, other disease states that they have. Ambient afflicted with COVID may be presenting later than um, someone in a more urban or suburban area due to access to healthcare would um have and so that's another confounding factor here that we're running into and again i know many of you have more rural um, congregations and live in those communities and so it's heightened in those communities that we do whatever we possibly can to educate and um, try to keep those communities safe through this uh, portion of the pandemic so at this time, I will answer any questions anyone has. Nothing is off limits. Um, I promise to be 100% truthful of the information I know. I will not hide anything or hold anything back. That's not my style. Um, and it is really about you all and what's important to you um, to know. And I will do my best. Please feel free to get second, third, fourth opinions. You will not offend me in any sort of way. Um, but I promise to, to, to be 100% honest with you so that way you have the best information as we know on today, July 30th of 2021. Okay, okay, Josh, we have a couple of questions in the uh, chat box. Uh, the first one is, what is the transmission rate for the Delta variant? It's a great question. So the way that we like to, to phrase it is, it is somewhere between every one individual that ultimately contracts COVID-19 Delta variant will transmit that to a minimum of six people that they come in contact, okay? To give you guys an idea, I am not old enough, I am 40, so I am not old enough to live in a time when measles was a big deal, um, but measles is about one to 18, okay? And that is one of the most um, viruses that spreads quicker than anything. I was young enough that I got chicken pox, I did not get a vaccine because I was still of that age, but chicken pox spreads at about one to six, one to eight. So, and if you guys remember of being in school and someone got chicken pox, almost the whole class got it back then. And so that is why this is so concerning and that higher rate of transmission. So that's a great question. School is getting ready to start. What is the healthcare concerns for schools that are not requiring masks? Yeah, so the, the concerns there are this. Um, teachers tend to fall in that younger cohort that is vaccinated at a rate of about 25 to 30%. So when you think about your general education population, one fourth out of our, for every four teachers we have, only one of them are gonna be vaccinated, okay? They are living in their community. Children are not immune to this disease. Children can spread this disease. I can tell you, again, I live in Columbia County, um, our, our school board has said right now they are not mandating masks. I can tell you right now, my son, who is in third grade, has already had the discussion that he will be wearing his mask at school. And again, he could get it from his friends, but we know the teachers are vaccinated at a low rate. I know Richmond County has taken a different stance on that. Um, I do not know what uh, some of the other outer line counties have come down on that. Um, but at this point in time, 
from my perspective, we need to be thinking about this at least for the next month about treating this like we did last year. Um, wh what is the latest on the CARE, any CARES Act funding or other funding that incentivizes the public to get vaccinated by providing payments to unvaccinated individuals? I think that's a great question. So CARES Act currently does not have funding that directly allows for direct payment or anything like that to an individual. What we have seen is some employers have given uh, four hours off of paid uh, time to get a vaccination. I know the Biden administration uh, this week has specifically stepped up the call about providing a certain reimburse or payment of 50 or $100 to any individual that gets vaccinated. Um, none of that has gone into place. I don't know how close that is to happening, but it is being discussed. We know certain states, I think Michigan, Illinois, some of the more states up north have done some things where you were eligible to be in a lottery to win money and different things like that. But to my knowledge, uh, at the federal level, nothing has been approved. There is only discussions. And at the state level, there is nothing that has been approved. And then I have not seen anything, at least in our local demographic area, that um, any of our municipalities have uh, gone ahead and approved any types of financial payment to individuals for vaccinations. What, what would you say to those of us who've gone back into the church already, uh, social distancing, wearing masks and whatever? What are some of those CD, if those CD guidelines are being followed? What, what, what is your opinion about those? So I will say I, I will give the facts and I will give the, my opinion, and that is it. So one of the big challenges is, again, um, regardless of the setting, whether we're talking about church congregations, whether we're talking about going to local grocery store or the hospital, is the, the people that, that if, you're back in, uh, if you're back in church and your congregation is there, whether you're social distancing, mask or non-mask, one of the things that we've done here recently is ask those that aren't vaccinated to wear their masks. And the problem with that is it's only as good as how that person chooses to have integrity on that day. And unfortunately, because this is such a polarized discussion, there are a lot of people that don't want to be branded one way or the other. And that is something that we have found um, personally with all my teams. Um, the team I support at AU is about 250 individuals. About 200 of those have been vaccinated. 50 of them have not. Of those 50 that have not, um, because of my role, I know who they are. And I can see where very high integrity people, very honest people, um, due to fear of ostracization, due to fear of any stigmas, they are choosing to represent that they are vaccinated when they're not. So CDC has recommended that vaccinated people wear masks indoors during this period of time. So if you are in uh, going to church on Sundays, Wednesdays, doing those type of things, the rule we have at the hospital is we have less than 10 and everyone vaccinated can not wear a mask. If your number goes over 10, regardless of setting, everyone needs to be masked up. So um, if you are going to continue um, going, having, holding church in person at this point in time, I would highly recommend that you maintain social distancing, you maintain um, mask wearing, and ask people to just be hyper vigilant for love of their fellow congregation member that if they have any symptoms or have been around anyone that has had any symptoms, that they not participate in in person church for that week, at least for the next month. Okay, uh, let's see, there was one other question in the chat box here. How, how effective are, are the masks against the Delta variant? So masks are kind of a loaded question. And I'm gonna say there are three types of masks for the general, for the point of this discussion. There are the cloth masks or something that you're gonna buy at a store um, or something like that. They are incredibly ineffective at protecting you from spreading or you from contracting the virus. The second level of, I'm sorry. So again. like, yep. So if you're wearing like a cotton mask, or some type of fabric mask that a lot of us were wearing um, in the very beginning, they are not very effective 
they're not very helpful at protecting you from spreading or from you for receiving the virus. I, I would not have a family member of mine um, if they were wearing a cloth mask, I would highly recommend them switch to one of these next two I'm going to talk about. Okay. So um, the next one you see are the traditional medical masks that a lot of us have worn that we were able to get readily at different places. Um, those are relatively effective, helpful in keeping you from spreading. They are less helpful in allowing you to contract the vaccine if you're exposed to it at high levels, okay? So that's kind of the second tier. That's the one people have the most access to and is very inexpensive. The third level and is the best is what they call an N95 or a KN95 mask. These are a little bit more expensive, but they, will they are much pr more protective from you spreading, but also from you being able to get the vac or be able to um, ultimately be infected. They are not 100%. I am going to say that nothing is 100% in this world, but it is very effective. They are more expensive. They generally run about a dollar a piece um, in my, my studies of them. Um, I do not wear a K90, KN95. I do not wear an N95 mask. Um, I wear the regular medical mask, so the one that's in the middle. Again, I'm 40. I am healthy. I am vaccinated. Um, it's, I just don't feel the need to necessarily take it to the next level. Now, my mother is 70 years old. Um, she has some health conditions. She lives in a rural area in North Carolina now. Um, she, we purchased uh, N95, KN95 masks for her, at least during this period of time. And she's fully vaccinated as well. Uh, but that kind of level of safety. So don't let the mask, the one thing I say is don't let the mask be a false sense of confidence for you that the type of mask matters and those three types, the general cloth masks, a medical mask, and then a K95 or an N95 mask. Okay, good. Um, another question. So you mentioned you were close to returning to church in person. <laughs> will, this sur will, <laughs> will this surge change your mind in returning in person? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to be, again, I promise to be honest with you guys. Um, since March of 2020, uh, my family has done church online from our back porch. And it kills me. I have two young kids. I have an eight-year-old and soon to be four-year-old. I have a wife that didn't grow up in the church, um, who's come to the church since we've been married. And it was a very, it was a very large part of my life. It was an anchoring factor in my life back when I was a child, when I was a young man and today. And, it, and it's been devastating for my family to not be able to have those interactions. That being said, um, I am not going back to church in person now until this wave of the pandemic is over. I am around too many people um, in the healthcare setting I've told you guys I coach youth sports, and it's something that I've tried to do throughout this because I think it's important for our youth to have semblance of normalcy during this. And I don't want to put myself at risk so that they can't do those type of things. Um, my wife also works with older individuals in a assisted living facility, um, and I also don't want to potentially expose her so that she potentially would expose any of the residents of her assisted living facility. So for my personal choice, was we are choosing not to go back in person until the, this kind of wave of the pandemic goes down. Okay, okay. good. Um, that's, that's all we have in the chat box. Let, let's just open it up for those maybe who are not doing in the, going in the chat box. Are there any other questions that we, wanna, we have for Dr. White? Well, and Howard, I would just wanna make, ask a question and kind of make it a little bit Please. Identify you. Identify you. This is Cedric Johnson. Okay. Okay. Uh, Josh, I think the thing that they really want to know, and, and not trying to put you on the spot, would you recommend going back in now, or would you recommend waiting for a period of time to go back in until the numbers go down? Yeah. I think that's a fair question, and I'm about to become the, the, the least popular person of the, the 65 
pastors and congregations that are on this call. But if you have not gone back at this point in time, out of abundance of caution, knowing that your congregations are in areas that are being disproportionately impacted right now by this Delta variant and will be over the next four weeks, um, I would personally be of the advisement to wait until we see this go down. I will be happy to jump on a call with anyone that Cedric or Reverend Howard asked me to at any point in time um, to have discussions about this. But I think we are going to see a drastic rising over the next few weeks, again, two to four weeks, and then we will hopefully see some type of um, decline. So I am thinking that sometime after Labor Day is when the target to be shooting for about going back into church. And it all depends on when that peak is. If that peak is in two weeks, right around after Labor Day is probably a good time. If the peak is after Labor Day, then we're probably looking closer to October 1st. That's to the point. Any, anyone else? You can you can go ahead and unmic if you want to. If you want to if you want to ask a question live, unmute yourself. Reverend Howard, this is Booker. Yes. Uh, uh, Josh, uh, are the symptoms the same for the Delta as it was for the others, or are there different symptoms? Yeah, gr great question. Uh, in general, your symptoms are almost identical to the same. The biggest thing that we see now, it, and uh, this is unfortunate, is again, we've become somewhat, um, we're, we're, we're less sensitive about the COVID-19 virus now in that if you get sniffles, your throat hurts a little bit, everyone I talk to says, oh, I just got a cold. And we're not testing as much anywhere in the country, anywhere locally or anywhere in our urban rural suburban communities. And so we need to go back to the thought process of any symptoms, especially associated with a fever, we treat as as we have COVID. And we really at that point in time need to be staying away from work, staying away from uh, other individuals and trying to keep ourselves safe during this and, and reducing that, that, that spread factor so that way we're not in the one person spreading it to eight people they come in, in contact with. So um, we had two managers this week, both had some type of symptom, neither one of them wanted to get tested. Oh, I've got kids. My kids bring the germs home. I'm, you know, I know what it is. One went and we just begged them to go get a rapid test. One went and got a rapid test. One was positive. One was not. One of their, the one that was positive, both their kids were positive. Wife was positive. Um, so now they've got a whole house of individuals who are positive. The other one was not. It happened to be a cold, but you really have to, we have to do this out of a, a true abundance of caution and treat any symptom that we have as if we have that covid uh, as if we've contracted COVID-19. Is there anything that we can do? I mean, as, as pastors, uh, is there any initiative uh, to get back out in the communities in some way to in, in, incentivize or get people to get vaccinated, those who have not? You know, I think the, the biggest thing is we have to restart the conversations. And again, I'm telling, I, I am admitting my faults in this, that as a health system, um, we, we could have done a much better job, especially from that kind of April period on. Um, and, and I could have done a much, much better job um, in terms of getting out and in educating and talking about the vaccine uh, as hopefully being a trusted resource. Most of the conversations I have in my life are people that know what I do, um, know I've been a part of the vaccine, they'll come and talk to me in private. Um, and we have conversations. And a lot of times it's about their loved ones, kids, wives, um, getting vaccinated. And if they should do it, the pros and cons, and we go through what the facts are. Um, and then ultimately, hopefully they, they make the decision through education that they feel empowered to be able to get the vaccine. And so what I would challenge, and I did an interview yesterday, is I'm challenging all healthcare workers. I'm challenging all of you that have had positive experiences with the vaccine, um, allowed some semblance of a return to normalcy for you is to not shy away from the, the conversations. 
and to have those conversations because we know that the 65 of you that are on this call carry a lot of weight in the communities you serve. And if you're having the conversation, then it's more likely others are having the conversation. But we've got to focus on that under 65 crowd. And we've got to speak to um, a lot of the people that are in the churches. We've got to speak to their children and we've got to speak to their grandchildren that are of age about getting the vaccine to protect them, but also to protect their loved ones as well. Josh, um, this is Cedric, uh, Reverend Howard, if you don't mind, I want to kind of step in here. I, I think this is probably a good time, Josh, because we both pretty feel the same way that we probably uh, didn't do enough uh, at the end of that April point in time to do it. But I think this is a perfect opportunity for you and I to go back to uh, our leadership and say that we talked to about 65 ministers and, and we need to pick back up that effort. And, and I don't want to speak for any of the ministers, but uh, from conversations with some of the ministers, uh, if we could probably look at maybe doing some more vaccines again in, mm -hmm. in, in communities that make people feel comfortable and coming back, uh, we probably can get uh, these ministers to help us get more people to get vaccinated. Yeah. Well, how, I, I, I 100% support that with you, Cedric. I'll okay. do everything on my side. All right, great. Okay, a couple other couple other follow ups, and one of those this may help us uh, too. And I, I, I guess uh, Josh, you can help us. Our earlier question was, what seems to be, and, and maybe we could have a little dialogue right after this is over. What seems to be the best language that works for unvaccinated individuals who've heard these myths? who's following, listening to social media, what seems to be the best language? Um, that, that is a great question. And, and I think there are two things. What works for me is when anytime the vaccine gets brought up, I always ask them what is keeping someone from moving forward to getting the vaccination. And I do my best to not have a defensive tone, not an accusatory tone, anything that puts them on the defensive, because that is not what my goal is. My goal is to begin a conversation. I do not expect to convert someone from non-vaccine to vaccine in one conversation. It's gonna take multiple. And so I think really approaching that person about what are their specific concerns? What, is, what have they heard that is concerning them? And again, we know most people, um, there's five reasons and we can, I'm happy to put together what those five reasons are and give you all the facts about why those are completely understandable, but here's the facts about them, and hopefully to begin that conversation with people. They're, again, they're the same five reasons they were in January, but again, I think it's that one-on-one -on -one with a trusted source that really makes a difference. The second part is, and this is the part where it gets tough, because again, people don't want to talk about these things, but is the, the number one thing when people say they moved from not getting a vaccine to getting a vaccine is they talk to a loved one or a friend or someone they trusted that got the vaccine that was able to talk about their experience. And so to me, the number one thing is talking about your experience and in, in your honest experience. Yeah, I got mine and I was tired the next day. But after that second night's sleep, I was good to go on both of mine. And I just talk about those things to people about what my real experience was. And if they're worried about the side effects, then that helps to get them over there because they've heard your personal experience and not something that they read on Facebook or something on Twitter or any of these other social media things um, that they heard in the community. That, those are the biggest things. So approach it from the, the standpoint of wanting to understand and then providing them with the facts and then being there whenever they want to have another conversation. Okay, maybe if we can put that together, Josh, and maybe get it to us, and I can I could disseminate that to to those of us that are interested in that language and those those five reasons. Yes, sir. That we can have, that we can have an answer for that. Be uh, my pleasure. At least, at least a response. Uh, uh, Reverend Howard. I'm sorry. I have a question more. 
how is it that how can we go about maybe even doing a getting Josh to do a town hall meeting with all of us and uh, having it somewhere where our parishioners, the congregants uh, can tune in and ask questions as well, doing something like we're doing here this morning. Mm. Okay. Is yeah, that, is that I... viable of what? Uh, I'm just throwing. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't speak for this group. I know that um, there's another pastor um, in the August area, which we did a, a Facebook live and I apologize. I don't do social media. Um, and so I apologize. I am the most ignorant person when it comes to social media, but I think it was Facebook live. It was videoed. Um, and it was, it was, it at least got a lot of good response from people, but that was also six months ago and the facts have changed and the situation has changed. So that is something that is of interest to this group, if it's of interest to have small group conversations, again, I am happy, whatever Reverend Howard and Cedric ask of me, I, I'm at y'all service. Okay. Yeah, let's talk about I think that's, that's a, that sounds like a good idea to me. And, and they can tune in and ask questions themselves. I Reverend think Howard, make, this, is, uh, yeah. this, is, this is Pastor Dukes uh, in Bonwell, Ned Branch. I, my question is, I, I heard um, Brother Josh said that he's coaching football. And let's say that we return to outside services and we have tents, we put up tents. What are the safety measures of, of when you're outside having service, having a pull-up service? What, what are the safety measures that we can look at? Or how close can we be then? So uh, that is a great question. And so if you are looking at how to hold services, and unfortunately, of course, we are in the dead of summer here around the Augusta, Georgia. Um, so not the most pleasant time outside, but outside is infinitely better than inside and um, if you're going to do that um, I think you can feel much more confident as long as we're maintaining some level of social distancing um, I would still ask those that are unvaccinated to consider wearing masks during that um, but I would feel much more confident myself attending something that was outside and I would feel much more confident with my mom um, or any of my loved ones attending something outside um, versus inside. I mean, at least that gets you back to in person. Okay. Well, good. Well, I think I got one, 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 two more questions. How effective are the ionization filters installed on HVAC units <laughs> at filtering out microorganisms and COVID viruses? Yeah, that is hard to say without knowing what each of the HVAC systems are. It's all gonna depend on your specific filtration. Um, I don't know a whole lot about HVAC. All I know is that I know some school districts invested um, a significant amount of money last year in schools to get that hyper HEPA filtration to eliminate uh, virus uh, particles floating in uh, the school systems and trying to protect the kids and the teachers. Um, my guess is um, my HVAC guy always told me they didn't want me to have the ultra high HEPA filters in my house because my HVAC unit needed a lot of air to work really well. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I believe him. Um, and so like, I do not have super uh, concentrated HEPA filters in my home. Um, we did adjust a little bit of the filtration we have in our house um, just because I've got kids at my house all the time and things like that because of sports. Um, but, um, but if you're in your church, you know, I certainly would consult whoever does the HVAC work for your, for your individual uh, church and ask them what their recommendations are that you can still feed your HVAC unit and keep it healthy and at the same time have the best filtration possible. It's a great question, though. Alton, um, T.C. Edwards, I have a question for the doctor. Um, I've had people tell me, which I don't believe, and I'm going to ask the doctor who have had COVID and they feel they don't have to get a shot because they can't get it anymore. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I've so, quite a few people that think that think that way. Yep. So, and here's the unfortunate thing. And I, and I hate this is the fact, but this is the fact is that the natural immunity that we obtain from the previous COVID-19 one, it goes away very quickly within a course of months. Secondly, is 
it is more specific to the strains that we saw originally in the alpha strain, depending on when they got sick and actually confers less protection against Delta because Delta attacks kind of in a different way. What we know about the vaccines is that even though the vaccines, uh, the mRNA vaccines, so the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, um, those uh, specifically only attack the, the spike protein um, as its target. And so it is incredibly effective against all of these other variants to this point. And so what my statement has been to people is, yes, you've gotten COVID-19. I need you to wait 90 days. And after 90 days, I need you to get vaccinated. And the beautiful thing about the people who have gotten COVID-19 and, and now have the opportunity to get vaccinated is they actually um, develop better immunity because their body's already been exposed once. We hit it with the vaccine, the first vaccine, that's twice. And then the third time they get more of these neutralizing antibodies, these things that protect us, our soldiers within our bodies that protect us, they get a higher level of those and people like myself who never had COVID and only have, and have had both of my vaccines. So they are actually at a point where they need it and they will become more protected than I will be protected, but they will lose their protection after three or four months. And if they got it uh, outside of Delta, it's not effective against Delta. Wow. Okay. Reverend Howard. Yes. Uh, Reverend Howard, this is James Williams. And I have a question to the doctor in reference to uh, having been vaccinated, um, I was vaccinated, say, now almost eight months ago. Uh, we are in, into the month of August. And should I be concerned about the, um, I'm sorry, should I be concerned about the uh, a booster for my vaccination uh, since I have yeah. been vaccinated? So it, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, should you be concerned? My answer is no, you still have tremendous protection against, uh, against Delta variant. However, what we do know is that the neutralizing antibodies, so the part, the soldiers that are like in our bloodstream that are there to protect us, they do decrease every month, okay? There's a separate type of immunity, uh, which is called T-cell immunity, and it is there and it will rev up, um, and protect you even though you don't have those neutralizing antibodies. So the natural question of this, and you, and you asked about it, is a booster vaccine. My belief is that in the next three to five months, the FDA is gonna move to full approval of the vaccine. I do believe that a booster dose will be indicated in the following populations. One, if you receive the J&J &J vaccine, you will be asked to, you will be recommended to get a booster dose with either Moderna or Pfizer. And if you are 60 years of age and older, um, you will be recommended to get a booster vaccine. And if you have an Im immunocompromised state, such as cancer, kidney disease, something like that, regardless of age, you will also be asked to um, potentially get the, the booster. That is what I am reading based off of the information, the literature that I'm seeing coming out, what we're seeing happen in Israel, what we're seeing happen in the UK, the discussion at the federal level, um, that is where I think it is, um, that's where I think it is heading. Okay, well, good. Listen, that's, we're right on, on the hour and I know you got to get back to the football <laughs> practice. <laughs> but let's adjust, let me thank you for, for taking the time out to uh, just kind of talk to us and give us some insight has been, in my opinion, been very helpful and to start the conversation. And uh, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll let you get back and, uh, and we'll maybe continue this conversation for another five or 10 minutes to see where we want to go from here. But do know that we will be calling back on you for, for more information, even in that form of a town hall, a virtual town hall or something yes, to sir. help get in these next three or four weeks to address our community. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I, and I, I appreciate it. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to serve and I appreciate y'all's friendship throughout this. And, and I look forward to continuing it. Like I said, anything I can do that you or Cedric ask of me, I will be there to, to serve. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Listen, I guess I, I, I this is this is a, a probably a smorgasbord of pastors that that we put together and 
and, and, and to have us together at one time like this may be a good thing. Where do you think uh, we ought to go from? I like the idea of the town hall meeting, but what can we do to help each other make decisions or can we form something that we can kind of keep this conversation going to impact those that we're leading? Pastor Howard, this uh, Reverend Gobbs, Pastor Gobbs from Spirit Creek. Um, if we took the information that Joshua just shared with us and we could archive it um, or get him to do another presentation um, and then save it, it can be saved Facebook Live and it could be saved on YouTube, then our congregations could access it at any particular time as many times as they want. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, that, now I wonder how does that work? Would they, if we put this on YouTube or, or whatever, just this conversation we've had this morning, if we maybe edit out some of, you know, some of this, what we're doing now, uh, will it show who, some all of the pastors that are involved in the conversation? No, it doesn't have to. Um, I have a daughter that is very tech savvy and she could, she could take care of it. Okay. Yeah, I just thought that it would be good if I if if if, uh, if my members, some of my members who were in doubt, saw the conversation and they saw that I was in the conversation, it may help. Okay, I, sway, I thought you sway, meant, the, sway them. I, mean, I thought you meant from a standpoint of not wanting the pastors to be shown. It 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 can go either way. It can go either way, right? I, I'm not. I'm, I was just raising the question. Okay. Well, let's let's keep my point is let's keep the conversation going, and uh, hopefully we have the contacts on everybody that's here that, and we can spread this conversation out a lot. I'll make the, I'll make sure this recording is available, and uh, I'll get it to us sometime this evening. I think it takes about an hour for it to kick back over into an email, and then I'll I'll maybe post it somewhere or get it to everybody, uh, so so we'll have it. Reverend Howard, uh, this is Cedric again. And, and what I would <clears throat> like to mention, uh, pastors, whatever y'all decide, please let Reverend Howard uh, give me or my pastor a call and we can get the university uh, health center to work with us uh, in any manner that uh, we think we might need. So I think now's the time to make the decisions of what you wanna do as a clergy and just let let us know. And then as Josh said, uh, he would also work with us to provide if it's again, opening up vaccines or more education or whatever we can do, please let us know. Brother Howard, Moses here. Uh, look, look here, uh, we're gonna make sure that we're gonna get with them to get those uh, five reasons and the response and the information and get make, make sure we're gonna get that. I'll make sure we get that next week. Yeah, as soon as, as he get as soon as he get them to me, I get them out to everybody. All and right, thank you. And you all can disseminate how I didn't I didn't get everybody here on the line. If you help get somebody on the line today, you make sure you share that information with them as well. Okay. Reverend Howard. Uh, yes. This is Reverend Williams. Thank you so very much, you and Cedric for and whoever that was helping to get this to us. What I'd like to see also is uh you know, you said you're going to transmit this to us so that we may be able to share it with some of our members, some of the deacons and uh, other people, but also to maybe meet once again in a three, four weeks uh, as we have today to let us know how it's working for us. Each one of us is going to try to put something together and to let us know what is working for us. The best test is what we're going to do. Amen. And next from it. But I just want to say thanks once again, and I sure would love a copy of it also. Okay. Thank you. Hey, okay. Reverend Howard, uh, more. I, I just received a text, one, one asking a question. I guess that should have asked Joshua when he was on, but should we require vaccinations for attendance and proof <laughs> with uh, the cards? Yeah, I, well... I think that's an individual question to everybody since, since we're in the churches we're at. I don't know if he could tell us that or not, but I think that is a good conversation to have. Uh, what, what do some of you all think about that? Uh, require uh, make it a mandatory to attend service. You have to have a, have, have a card. 
What are some of the pros? I don't, pros I don't believe cars? you can legally do that. Okay. You open yourself up to we're we're litigious society. You open Who's yourself speaking? up to oh Reverend Franklin, pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church in Edgefield. You okay. open yourself up to to any number of legal issues, but I believe that it is a conversation that you can have with anyone just in conversation. Reverend Howard, you you are vaccinated, right? And the answer is telling. And you're you're either gonna say yes or you're gonna pause, and that pregnant pause gives answer. <laughs> Okay. Uh, also, also, this Moses Anderson. Uh, uh, also, uh, one of the issues you're going to run into: there are some people who have medical conditions where they cannot take the shot. That's correct. Mm -hmm. they Carlton, I wanted to too. say um, this: TC Edwards. You know, the question about whether you can require someone. You know, uh, President Biden just announced on Thursday for all federal workers mm -hmm. and contractors. Um, and I work at the Savannah River site, been there 35 years. One of the things that we're going to on the site, you're going to have to show that you've been vaccinated or you will be tested once a week. Mm -hmm. And that's going into effect now, you know, federal government is, in, you know, they're imposing this. And from what um, President Biden said on Thursday, if you watch this press conference, one of the things the Justice Department is looking into is whether um, private companies and organizations can, you know, make that same move. So they're looking into that. Uh, Reverend Howard. <clears throat> Sir. Uh, this is uh, Reverend Oscar Brown from Pleasant Grove Baptist in Edgefield. Um, I was listening to a uh, Zoom conference from Dr. Bell in South Carolina with Department of Health, DHEC in South Carolina. And she mentioned that churches can uh, mm. require people to show whether they are vaccinated or Excellent. not. You can set that policy. And there is a Zoom uh, conference that she sent me. And if possible, I can send that to you, Reverend Howard, and you can disseminate it to everybody to see what is, re what is mentioned within that conference. And it also talks about those churches that are open and whether they should close up again, stay open, and how they should do other things. Uh, I'll send that to you, Pastor Howard. Okay. Pastor Howard. Pastor yes, Howard. Uh, this is uh, Larry Sims, Solid Rock Baptist Church. Uh, listening to uh, Dr. Weich, um, he just stated that even if vaccinated, uh, if you're in a setting where there's more than 10 people, you still need to wear your mask. And so I think requiring to prove your vaccination um, isn't necessarily helpful in the sense that you're still gonna have to wear your mask and then you are gonna have people that have health conditions that preclude them from getting the mask. And so now you run into the issue of, uh, you know, I'm a tithing member and, and you're not allowing me uh, to come to my church. <laughs> So um, having everyone wear their masks, uh, I think doing the ionization, the, the filter, uh, anything you can do to spray prior, um, having uh, one way in, one way out, or multiple exits, entrance, um, having your social distance, all of these things are just additional barriers. But the primary barrier, offensive weapon, is the vaccination. 